Greetings everyone and welcome to our Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics of the federal Chicago trial with the obstruction charges and the federal appeal. Everything is working hand in hand together. Having that ultimate belief that as it goes down, as we see it go down, all will be as it should be. So welcome today. I want to talk to you about a clip regarding the testimony of Jane and why things happened the way that they did back in the day and different things like that. But I also want to include a tinge of educational component to it as well, which is the false statement of perjury. And we're going to go over what the federal criminal law says about that. So we're going to be able to put this on the back burner because as we all know, in 2008, she refused to testify. She said it wasn't her on the tape, but today, 30 years later, plus she's saying it is her. So let's listen to some clips and then also get deep into the concept of perjury and false statements. Okay, here we go. Playing out in R. Kelly's trial today. Kelly is charged with enticing minors for sex, producing child pornography, and rigging his child pornography trial in 2008. WGN's Julian Cruz is in the Dirksen Federal Building with the latest. Good evening. High stakes for recording artist R. Kelly, already sentenced to 30 years in prison by New York jurors, but the R&B singer looking at the possibility of more prison time if a Chicago jury finds him guilty on charges that he abused underage victims and conspired to rig his 2008 trial at Cook County Circuit Court, where Kelly was acquitted. R. Kelly pictured at bottom right facing serious allegations with former associates Daryl McDavid and Milton Brown charged as well. All three men before U.S. District Judge Harry Leinenweber at Chicago's Dirksen Federal Courthouse. From the years 1996 to 2001, Prosecutor Jason Julian says in his opening statement, Mr. Kelly reportedly had sex with young children who were 14, 15, and 16 years old multiple girls hundreds of times. Julian warning the jury that the videotapes are hard to watch. Video allegedly recorded by Kelly said to show the R&B singer sexually assaulting underage girls. Kelly and his associates in the months before the 2008 trial, according to prosecutors, accused of paying off a teenage victim who was to be the star witness in the Cook County trial. She refused to testify and Kelly was later acquitted. But when it comes to the federal trial in Chicago, Kelly's lawyers pleading with jurors to ignore the pretrial publicity. He's entitled to an unbiased jury, says Jennifer Bonjean, Kelly's defense attorney. That's a tall order, she argues. But you all said you could do it, and you were chosen because of that, and we're going to hold you to it. Prosecutors in opening statements showing their hand reveal a testimony from a 37-year-old witness. That 37-year-old was the star witness or was to be the star witness at the 2008 Cook County Circuit Court trial where Kelly was acquitted. You may recall at the time that witness refusing to testify. At the Dirksen Federal Building, Julian Cruz, WGN News. Okay, so some of the comments. Some of the comments that came out from this clip is saying that in the video, he is seen giving her money before the activity starts. She says it's because if it ever got leaked out, now you're thinking futuristically now. You're not thinking present moment. You're thinking for the future. Um, I don't see R. Kelly even doing that. Because if he did give her the money, if the if this person in the video is him giving her the money, it is for a sexual transaction. A person is going to just drop their child off and leave her there with Godfather. I don't understand what Godfather represents in this situation. You know, um, 
how did they even arrive at that? Knowing that he had a situation like this long before or it, it, it the allegations were there. So VA says, and they haven't found not one underage girl, not one. I'm following the case too, so tell it all. FP says, y'all forgot to mention the victim's immunity deals. That's right, FP. Tiffany, I get it all now. The fake racketeering case and trial was only to bring back and solidify the case which was acquitted 20 years ago. So intelligent, intelligent, got it, double jeopardy. So they are bringing it back and it is double jeopardy from what it's seeming to be. Um, now we're gonna go over a few vital points within the testimony of Jane, one, uh, Jane. and but before we do that, I want to look at and I want to put an educational piece into this podcast for the sake of research and study methods. So before we go into the clip from CBS, I want to talk about the false statements and perjury and what the overview of federal criminal law states as of May 11th, 2018. And this was submitted by the Congressional research study informing the legislative de debate since 1914. So basically it says federal courts, cr Congress and federal agencies rely upon truthful information in order to make informed decisions. Federal law therefore prescribes for providing the federal courts, Congress or federal agencies with false information. The prohibition takes form for uh, four forms false statements, perjury in judicial proceedings, perjury in other contexts, and sub, sub subordination of perjury. So let's look at the four, the four elements. False statements under 18 USC code 1001. The principal federal false statement statute prescribes false statements, concealment, or false documentation in any matter within the jurisdiction of any of the three branches of the federal government. It applies generally within the executive branch, within the judicial branch. It applies to all but presentations to the court by parties or their attorneys in judicial proceedings. Within the legislative branch, it applies to administrative matters such as procurement, as well as to any investigations and reviews conducted pursuant to the authority of any committee, subcommittee, commission, office, or Congress. Okay, in outline form of 1001, except as otherwise provided in this section, number two is whoever, number three, in any manner, within the jurisdiction of the executive, legislative, or judicial branch of the government of the U.S. and knowingly. So let's look at whoever. The Dictionary Act provides that in determining the meaning of any act of Congress, unless the context in indicates otherwise, the word whoever includes corporations, companies, associations, firms, partnerships, society, and joint stock companies, as well as individuals, Includes is usually a but not limited to word as a general rule. So why did Jane come back years later and recant her story? As far as this perjury clause state under section 1001 knowingly and willfully requires the government to prove and this is where prosecution must prove that the defendant acted knowingly and willingly. Um, and this would be a defend. This would be Jane as the defendant eventually through a an appeal. It requires that the government show the defendant that they knew or elected not to know that the statement, omission, or documentation was false, and that the defendant presented it with the intent to deceive. She intended to deceive us. 
because she says she knew it. She says she totally understood that she was in love with him and she wanted to cooperate whatever story he needed her to cooperate, even down to the point where she didn't even honor her parents to the point where she didn't even, you know, let her parents know, supposedly. The phrase knowing and willfully refers to the circumstances under which the person made the statement, omitted a fact, was obliged to disclose or include it within the documentation that the person knew that the statement was false when it was made or which amounts in the law, the same thing, concisely disregarded or averted eyes from the likely falsity. Although the offense can only be committed knowingly and willfully, that is with the knowledge that it was unlawful, she knew that's why she chose not to present herself in court at that time, whether she got paid or not at this particular moment, her, this is why I believe that the Chicago trial is going to be again, he's going to be acquitted of it because of the fact that she knowingly and willfully withheld information many, 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 many years ago. And this is what I think Bonjean is going to represent and present in her argument and cross-examination, concealing false statements and false writings. Section 1001 false statement element is in fact three alternative elements that encompass concealment, false statements, and false writings. Concealment applies to anyone who falsifies, conceals, or covers up by any trick, scheme, or device a material fact. Although the requirement does not appear on the face of the statute, prosecutions under subsection for concealment must also prove the existence of a duty or legal obligation not to conceal. And I believe that she had a right to report. There were too many individuals in her life at that given moment that would have protected her from the police to the social service agencies, to the schools, to the people who were uh, other authority figures. Why does she have to only listen to the one authority figure, Robert Sylvester Kelly? So this goes on, but I want to get right to the perjury part. General, Generally, 18 U.S.C. 1621. Now, I want you to look that up. It's testimonial perjury. Testimonial perjury. Give me one second. See, and this is where I think she's going to fall into. As noted earlier, there are three primary perjury statutes. Each involves a statement or written offer under oath that is equivalent. One, one prescribes two forms of perjury generally. A second prescribes perjury before a court or grand jury. A third prescribes subordination of perjury that consists of arranging for someone else to commit perjury. So let's look. Any material matter which he does not believe to be true or is guilty of perjury and shall expect as otherwise expressly provided by law, be fined under this title or in prison, not more than five years or both. This section is applicable whether the statement or subscription is made within or without the U.S. Now, mind you, the Me Too movement could be setting this woman up, literally, because if cross-examination goes as powerful as I know Bonjean can get down, I'm guaranteeing that there's going to be a question relating to, you know, um, being held in perjury, you know, so the Me Too movement could be setting Miss Jane up. And what's so crazy about it is to get someone for something that they couldn't get from before, just to make sure that they get him, they can take a lot of other innocent people down if they had to just left it alone, Jim Dare Goddess. And when you haven't taken an oath in section 1621.1, in so many words, whoever having taken an oath reaches sworn, written, or oral testimony presented to a federal 
person. You got to be truthful and it can't be all ambiguous. So is, is that why you chose? Because if you chose to not testify before, you perjured yourself in the second opportunity, which then creates the double jeopardy clause, not for Robert Sylvester Kelly and the obstruction, but of Robert Sylvester Kelly and this tape. Because now we're dealing with the same individual in the same situation. And that, that is how you consider double jeopardy. But it's crazy. The two witness rule, since we have more, you know, um, to establish that a statement is false under the rule, the uncooperated oath of one witness is not sufficient to establish the falsity of the testimony of the accused that set forth in the indictment as perjury. Thus conviction under section 1621 compels the government. So Prosecution has to establish the falsity of the statement alleged to have been made by the defendant under oath by the testimony of the independent witnesses. So if there was a witness, a witness, I think it might have been her, her aunt or something that said that she's seen this tape or Jim Dare Goddess, if they're going to call him forward. This is where the two, the, the witness rule comes into play. Because if the rule is to be satisfied with corroborating evidence, the evidence must be trustworthy. It's not trustworthy because she lied from the very beginning. She withheld information. She withheld information knowingly. So this is what I want you to understand when we get ready to go through this process. It can work so many different ways because there's so many rules of law that nobody is even talking about yet. We're not even talking about double jeopardy. Let's take a look at what double jeopardy is. Let's take a look at what double jeopardy is. The double jeopardy clause in the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution stops anyone from being prosecuted twice for substantially the same crime. The relevant part of the Fifth Amendment states no person shall be subjected to the same offense to be twice tried in jeopardy of losing limb, limb life or freedom. OK, so the double jeopardy clause, we will go over that another day. But let's listen to the clip of what was stated that now has people in an uproar. Um, but it's only from the prosecution side. So they're presenting this this dark side, this this chaotic moment in time. Showing R. Kelly, you know, as a young man having issues you know, with no one to guide him in this field of multi-million dollar star status. So let's take a look and listen at this and listen to how this girl lies. She lies to her mother. She lies to her aunt. She manipulates him and, and basically prostitutes herself. And I feel really, really, you know, some kind of way about especially protecting young children. Yes, young children at any means measure should be protected. But when you're throwing your child out there, you're saying, and I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in my life before and I've seen it happen. And I've always said, well, wow, why can she get a boyfriend and I can't get a boyfriend, da, 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 da. It wasn't my journey. That was not my journey to fulfill. So now we're going to go to this clip because I can keep going on and on and on and on about this testimony right here. And it's very quiet today. Today is Friday, August the 19th. So they will probably begin deliberations on the defense side by Monday. And I guarantee you, Bonjean going to shut it down. She's going to create all kinds of questions like, why did you feel so compelled at 37 to be this strong after a Me Too movement? But we'll keep continue to keep talking about that. But let's listen to the CBS and this WSN clip. It's it's somebody and their their information is there in case you need to, you know, review it yourself separately. So here we go. Witness the woman who the entire child pornography case is centered around took the stand. It is the first time she's told her story to jurors. CBS 2's Tara Molina was in the courthouse when she spoke. Tara, dramatic testimony. 
Jim, to say the least, and we want to warn you about the disturbing nature of all of this before we get into it. Jane details her sexual relationship with Kelly that all started when she was just 14, including sex acts Kelly reported and the expectation that she keep it all quiet. She's not using her real name, and you can see her face was not drawn in court. But Jane, taking the stand for the first time, made a pivotal record with her testimony. Now 37, she said her relationship with R. Kelly started at 12 or 13. Introduced by her Aunt Stephanie, a musician working with Kelly at the time. Jane, a singer in a group then, said her relationship with Kelly changed within weeks of asking Kelly to become her godfather, helping with her music career. Be within weeks of becoming... The Godfather, what does this Godfather represent? Um, it's like that gave the family a connection to him or were, were the whole family starstruck? Is that what it was? I need my um, Kelly Nation supporters to put that in the link and tell me what that means. What? Put that in the uh, chat box. What does that Godfather stand for? Because they continue to say it. You know what I mean? Like, was that a way of saying that he was, quote, the authority, you know, the adult in charge? Well, I can look at some 12 year olds today and see them making major decisions like they're adults thinking when no one's looking, they can do whatever they want. So I know back then the girls were way faster. And not only that, you have, I mean, I can specifically remember an arranged marriage with the older man and a younger uh, church person that went to church with me. And she was like 12 or 13 when she had her first baby. So, I mean, these things happen in the hood. You know, when you have sexual activity with no sex education. So the money part has me. The money that he gave at the beginning has me. And I believe that if he was going to record it, I don't think he was expecting it to leak out but if it did leak out you know i can see that but it's too futuristically it's too it's, it's done with too much futuristic value to it and if he was that naive to record videos like that then he knew that that was going to be a situation or it could be so I can see that them using that, but I don't know. I think somebody else was involved in this and it, and, and they're not being shown in the, in the background. The, the background footage is not being shown, but let's keep going. Coming sexual. She said it started with phone sex. Kelly asking her about her underwear, turning physical when she was 14. Kelly would give her alcohol. She said it helped loosen her up, describing pornographic videos he would play during this, featuring people she knew, eventually engaging in group sex acts with underage friends. She said Kelly encouraged her to bring around, testifying the physical relationship continued and she lost her virginity to Kelly at the age of 15. She said she had sex with Kelly an uncountable number of times. Hun how do we, how can we believe this? This is the same girl that denied having sex in 2008, but we should believe her now. Juries don't fall for the okie doke. Please don't fall for it. This right here, like that lady said, it was a, a implication to bring forth charges now because 2008 was acquitted. They're reinventing the, they're reinventing the story with the twist of something else. Fritz. Many of those acts recorded by Kelly, sex tapes Jane said she wasn't comfortable with. Where were her parents during all of this? Jane said once she told them R. Kelly was her godfather working on her music with her, 
They were comfortable with her being at his studio. Starstruck. Starstruck. Oh, she's about to make it big. She's about to do the damn thing. You know, young women are able to entice as well. And I'm going to read you a clip where she was told to rub on his head, call him daddy. <clears throat> rub on his head, call him daddy, and ask him to be the godfather to help her with her career. I thought that was Azrael Clary. But now we have another statement saying the same thing with this girl. Kelly was married at the time, and Jane said oftentimes her parents thought she was at home with them, not at the studio alone with Kelly. But it didn't stay that way. Later in her testimony, Jane detailed being forced by Kelly to tell her parents about their sexual relationship, claiming he confirmed a sex tape of theirs had been leaked and was about to be public. She said Kelly told her he wanted her parents on his team, detailing a meeting arranged with Kelly and her parents. Now, what black, what black? family do you know that's going to allow something like that to happen and don't take it up with the person don't take it up with the person so something was already understood something was already understood with the parents and this child parents at an oak park hotel she described her father's response as hysterical saying she vividly remembers her father telling kelly i can't help you I can't help you. What does that mean? Now, ultimately, pr prosecutors say that Jane and her parents were pressured and paid off to lie, threatened by the singer and his team. Her testimony and cross-examination expected to start back up here first thing tomorrow morning. This trial set to run about four weeks. So, <laughs> I just, I don't see it. There's a lot of things missing. A lot of things missing. And what I'm going to assume is that this article here that I'm from CBS Yeah, from there, Jane said her aunt Stephanie brought her to Kelly's recording studio with her and encouraged her to sit on his lap rub his head and ask him to be her godfather. She said that's when everything changed. Within weeks, their relationship became sexual. She said she started having the phone sex. Okay, we heard that. Um, she said Kelly was married at the time and Jane said oftentimes her parents thought she was at their home with them, not at the studio alone with Kelly. Jane will be back on the stand Friday to face cross-examination from Kelly's attorneys. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to see what Bonjean is going to cross-examine her on. And I know that it, it, it definitely will be, why did you change the story? Why did you choose to do, to say this now? What provoked you to speak now about this? Because see, the Me Too movement has start, has already started from 2019, right? So there's a big reason why he's why he's back in Chicago and why she's back as well. Jane now 37 testifies she viewed Kelly as an authoritative figure. At the time, you didn't think of your mother and father as authoritative figure. You didn't think of your mother and father. You guys didn't have a a communication open enough to just say this man touched me yesterday. I was at the studio and I was just sitting there and he touched me in an inappropriate way. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I felt uncomfortable, but I looked up to him. She testified. It somewhat became normal. And then she started to have feelings for him. She developed feelings for Robert Sylvester Kelly. He said he loved me, said he would take care of me, said he would protect me. It made me feel good, she testified. She also told the jury she considered herself to be submissive and wanted to give Kelly everything 
he required. Isn't that what someone else said too? Same thing. It's like they're taking bits and pieces of another person's story and plugging it in. Like we don't see. We don't see the whiz standing behind the curtain, pulling the little strings and, you know, pretending that it's something else. She asked why she was willing to do those things. Jane testified she thought she was in love with Kelly at the time and didn't want him to think she wasn't cooperating with him. Okay. Kelly first instructed her to keep their relationship secret. When they started having phone sex, she was around 13 or 14. She said Kelly told her they got could get in trouble and it was very important she remained loyal to him. So I guess the loyalty is the reason why it took so long. Jane testified about three recordings that were played for the jury, showing her and Kelly at his Georgia street house in his bedroom and living room. She said she watched each of those in preparation for the trial. In one of the videos, Jane said the two were involved in the bedroom and he asked her to describe herself to him while on camera. Okay, so... Jane testified she lied to the DCFS because she was afraid and wanted to keep their relationship intact. She didn't even tell her parents, she said, because it was something she would take to her grave to protect Kelly. So now you're not taking it to your grave. Now, it, it, now that he's in Chicago, it's important. So I just don't know. I'm not going to read any more of this. I just want it to be known that this is what's going on um, and to give a little bit of feedback and understanding as to um, what's going on in the courtroom with the Robert Sylvester Kelly. Um, Wow. Mm -mm -mm. I'm looking at some other things. So now we have more of prosecution sharing and expressing their views in tweets, in top media exposure. This is what's going on right now. So we just sit back and listen, watch, observe, and get ready for the defense. You know, um, I really don't have, I'm going to incorporate this with the defense questioning and testimony because there is, uh, there's really nothing to report on this side. We already know that Jim Derrick Goddess feels the way that he feels. And, um, we already know, we already know what that is. Let me see if anything it's on the docket that's new. That should be reported. Nope, everything is still frozen. So that's what I wanted to report today. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for your comments. And I just, yeah, those are the two main things that I have. I have the issue of the money exchange and the fact that it's been over 20 years. And I also have the area of thought about 
the Godfather situation? Those are extreme questions for me that if I was a juror, I think I would be saying, well, why did the parents go on vacation? They weren't afraid to go on vacation with the money. And there is no way that I'm going to allow you to abuse my daughter and get away with it. You know, unless, of course, you guys have an agreement. So that's what I want to say today. And we'll keep you posted on other things as they come up. And um, yeah, just keep the faith and just keep knowing what you know. Because to me, it looks very, very funny. It looks very funny. I was trying to find those responses I received. Didn't R. Kelly get acquitted in 2008? Then why is he on trial for the same thing? Isn't that considered double jeopardy or maybe just in other countries? Keep the faith, Kelly, because I am for sure fancy. Maurice, they basically double jeopardied him. Michelle, at least four of the jurors seen and or heard the about the documentary. So this isn't going to make a difference now since the judge showed to allow, chose to allow those jurors to sit in that jury box. I just don't see how any of this will be carried out. Me either. Wait and see. Just remember, it's two sides. Mm -hmm. At Maurice, that's the thing. Prosecution testimony is all over the news. I don't hear about much from the defense. Has Bonjean cross-examined Jane? Would be, though, I can imagine. Yeah, she's going to cross-examine. Just, just stay tuned. It's coming. It's coming. Mm hmm Yvette says this Chicago trial is not that big like we think. We all knew this twenty nineteen before anybody picked him on he picked him or his picked his jury. Mm hmm So yeah, it's really nothing. It's just the same old. Same old, same old. But um, I can't wait to see what Bonjean has to rebut this statement on. And believe me, you, it's going to be very confusing for the jury because of the way that things were pushed forward and spoken. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. We'll see you next time. And as always, keep it 100. Peace and blessings.